Welcome to St. Louis on the Air. I'm Don Marsh. This evening, Emmy-winning Bill Nye, known to millions as the science guy, will bring both his intellect and humor to town to tackle the topic of climate change. He and Carl Pope deliver the keynote session at St. Louis University's three-day St. Louis Climate Change Summit. St. Louis Public Radio science reporter Eli Chen talked by phone with Nye last week, and here is that conversation. Like a lot of other young adults, I grew up watching your television show, you know, in science classrooms and in my family's living room. But these days with your programs, uh, like your Netflix show, Bill Nye Saves the World, you've become really focused on adults. So I'm wondering how you adjust your approach to make science appealing to older, more mature crowds. Oh, well, the, the big change is what I call the discipline in the vocabulary, the DIV. This is very important. So with grown-ups, you don't have to have you can talk to grown-ups using grown-up words, which is a shortcut, and you can talk to grown-ups about grown-up issues that involve voters, taxpayers, people that make decisions for society. Like we did a show on marijuana, which is controversial because it's a Schedule One drug, and it's a Schedule One drug because people believe it has no medical value, yet people use it for medicine. Well, why don't we study it? Well, you can't study it because it's a Schedule One drug, and so that's a complicated thing. Uh, a kid probably doesn't have that much interest in that. So sure. when you talk to grown-ups, you can use grown-up reasoning. Yeah, adult topics. So, you know, it seems like when I hear about you in the news, it's Bill Nye versus the skeptics, skeptics of climate change, skeptics of evolution. And, you know, given how much the field of science communication has evolved since you began doing television, do you think giving the facts alone are enough to reach the general public? The general public, uh, well, so there's a couple things there. So the journalists are trained reasonably to present both sides of an issue. As uh, Dr. Phil says, no matter how thin the pancake, there's still two sides or something like that. <laughs> but when it comes to climate change, you understand the scientific evidence is overwhelming. There's no scientific disagreement. What's, what's happened is uh, the fossil fuel industry has been successful in introducing the idea to the public that somehow plus or minus 2% scientific uncertainty is exactly the same as plus or minus 100% doubt about the whole thing. So when you say science communication has changed, it may have changed in the sense that there's less discipline among journalists or or websites or uh, podcast-style news sources than there would be back in print-only days or radio and television-only days. So this is why we say all the time, the skill that we need to imbue or promote in consumers of news is critical thinking. How likely is it that a woman running for president of the United States had a pizza restaurant with a child pornography ring associated with it? It's not very likely, really. But somehow people... We're able to introduce that idea, and enough consumers accept it, consumers of news accepted it that it, it led to trouble. So uh, when it comes to you guys, you're using the term skeptic. People who are skeptical of climate change really are much more just in denial of climate change. The, ev- the scientific evidence is overwhelming. People who are skeptical of evolution that they're, in my view, borrowing a scientific term or a logic term to describe what other people would, uh, a psychiatrist or rather, psych- I mean psychologist, would call as outright denial or contrarianism. But mm-hmm. I know what you mean. So it's a problem. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm a news producer myself. I'm the science reporter here at St. Louis Public Radio. When you say discipline, what does that mean exactly? What, are, what could journalists like me be doing better? Oh, uh, what could you? You're great. You couldn't be doing anything better. You're just, no, uh, just on a kid's show, you can't, <laughs> you can't, using the word anthropogenic on a children's show might confuse people. It's hard enough for adults, right? So the discipline in the vocabulary is to exchange a phrase like human-caused climate change with the adjective anthropogenic or anthropogenic greenhouse gases. 
or anthropogenic global warming, AGW. If you're a fourth grader, AGW is is not readily accessible to you in your everyday experience. But humans spewing carbon dioxide, you could understand, I think. Right. I also work part-time as a producer with a science storytelling podcast that you're probably familiar with, The Story Collider. And I'm curious to know what role personal storytelling has um, in advancing science communication, in, in your opinion. Storytelling is the key to everything, to, to understanding anything. But when you say personal storytelling, when I, uh, maybe, I mean, I'm not sure that everybody has a personal experience with nuclear reactors, for example. Hmm. Uh, but everybody has a personal experience with electricity, I'm thinking out loud. So you want to tell stories that that your audience uh, can accept or feel that they are part of or could be part of, don't you think? You want to tell a story that where the listener could be the protagonist kind of thing. The word protagonist, you probably wouldn't use that on a fourth grade show, probably. <laughs> probably not. There are some oh. out there who find your approach to science skepticism off-putting, that it feels like sometimes you're telling people to get an education, and if they did so, they'd fully embrace, you know, the impact that climate change is having on our planet, for example. I'm wondering, you know, how much you've heard of that criticism of your work, and what do you think of it? With due respect, I've never heard that specific criticism till just now. Oh, okay. Have you seen the movie? I have not yet. My experience yeah. with the climate deniers is just haters going to hate. And so the big thing with the climate deniers, in my experience, is that I don't have enough education, that Bill Nye does not have a Ph.D. in climate science, therefore he cannot read a graph or accept overwhelming scientific evidence in, in published in papers. Kind of, I mean, if I understand your question, it's not exactly um, – what I hear isn't exactly what you're asking about. Okay. But with that said, in the movie – I give advice to somebody who I believe is nine years old, and I, I tell her, I hope you go to college. And that could be where that criticism comes from. But uh, anyway, with that said, when it comes to climate change or human-caused global warming, you don't really need a Ph.D. to get it. You need to be able to reason and evaluate arguments. Uh, the reason the overwhelming majority of scientists around the world are concerned about climate change is because of the world getting warmer all the time over the last two and a half centuries. You don't really need a Ph.D. in, in nuclear physics to understand that we can measure the temperature of the sea su surface by counting neutrons and oxygen atoms in snow that you just need to be able to think about the water cycle and and what's possible. What field of science are you the most excited about these days? Well, for me, I want to be alive when we find evidence of life or life, living life on another world, on Mars or Europa, the moon of Jupiter with twice as much ocean water as the Earth. That would be amazing. That would be amazing. And then the other thing to be excited about, uh, two other things that are seem divergent, is uh, what is dark matter and dark energy? What is all this? What's going on? Why do we believe that we only can see 94 percent, uh, I mean, rather 6 percent of the universe and 94 percent of it is invisible and unknown to us? That's extraordinary. Last summer, we showed, proved, dis measured gravitational waves for the first time in human history, and these were predicted to exist 100 years ago. So just think what will happen when that's better understood. And then the other area of science that's just going wild is genetics. It's CRISPR technology, the palindromic gene repeat thing. If you could engineer um, human eggs and sperm so they don't have genetic defects, 
That would be amazing. And if you could make a medicine that could somehow insinuate itself in enough of your cells to eliminate a genetic condition that's undesirable, Parkinson's disease, for example, or something, that would be just amazing. So those two things, the, the cosmos and our own bodies, I imagine there'll be fantastic advances in the next couple decades. Yeah, and I look forward to seeing those advances as well. Um, the third season of your Netflix show is coming out on May 11th. What can we Don't expect? Don't miss in... it if you can. <laughs> I won't. <laughs> what can we expect from it? The time of your life, the greatest moments ever in your television watching career. No, it'll, uh, we think it's fun and cool, and uh, we hope you enjoy it. Put our heart and soul into this thing. And, um, you know, when you're working with Netflix, you have resources. We sent people all over the world, brought back very cool stories. And we really hope you come away from the show with something to think about. Well, Bill, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. That was Bill Nye, the science guy, speaking with St. Louis Public Radio science reporter Eli Chen. Nye and environmentalist Carl Pope will deliver the keynote session this evening at 7 at St. Louis University's St. Louis Climate Change Summit at the Chaffetz Arena. Also, Nye's Netflix series, Bill Nye Saves the World, is about to launch its third season. And you can see Bill Nye's 90-minute PBS documentary, Bill Nye the Science Guy, on the PBS website. More information is available at stlpublicradio.org slash stlonair. Archive versions of past St. Louis on the Air programs are available for download or podcast at stlpublicradio.org slash stlonair. St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio, 90.7 KWMU. Thank you for listening. I'm Don Marsh. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association. Missouri produces wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details on the variety of products made in the state are at ChooseWood.com.